Charismatic Witchcraft is the title of this third se- the message in this series, Seductions Exposed. Let's read together. Follow along with me. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the Spirit to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now pay attention this morning what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying that we have a spirit and we have flesh. We have the Spirit of God inside of us wanting us to obey the law of God, wanting us to follow the ways of God. But we also have the flesh, the sinful nature that wants to do contrary to what God's law says. It wants to do the opposite of what God is telling us to do. Now, I don't care how long you've been saved, how sanctified you think you might have been, how many generations of preachers there are in your family, every one of us in this place have got a problem called flesh. Some of us got more flesh than others, and I don't mean that literally in the natural, but you know what I'm talking about. We all have a problem called the flesh. Now, the Bible says in the next verse here, verse 19, that the acts of, the, of your flesh or the acts of your sinful nature are obvious. In other words, these are, not, these are not strange things. Some of you may think, man, pastor's preaching on witchcraft this morning. What's that have to do with me? No, listen. Paul says this list that I'm about to mention to you, these acts of the flesh are very obvious. In other words, you see Christians battling with them on a daily basis. They are obvious, he says in verse 19, and he lists them. He says sexual immorality impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He says this, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. This morning we see here the Apostle Paul is writing to spirit-filled Christians about the battle between their spirit and their flesh. And in this list, in this running list of the what we're calling the works of the flesh, he speaks about witchcraft. He mentions in this list of idolatry and adultery and fornication and envy, In this list, he lists witchcraft. Now, the reason this message is in the series Seductions Exposed is because, for the most part, the pew has no revelation of how witchcraft is operating in the church. Most Christians have no idea how witchcraft is being used by the enemy to create division and to destroy churches all over the world. Now the question this morning is, what is witchcraft? Now witchcraft, if you're taking notes, in its most simplest definition, it means to control or to manipulate. Witchcraft means to control or it means manipulation. Now most of us are only familiar with classical witchcraft. In other words, maybe we think of when we hear witchcraft or hear of a witch, we think of an old lady with a a wart on her nose, if you will, dressed in black, riding a broom, and she's controlling another person with her spells and with her potions and and, and with an aid of an evil spirit. And, And Hollywood and Disney has given us that mindset of classical witchcraft Praise God. But Hollywood and Disney has given us this this really false interpretation of what witchcraft is. This lady riding around on a broom controlling people with her spells and with her potions. But I want you to know this morning, as much as Hollywood has twisted witchcraft, classical witchcraft in its purest form is still a very real thing. Matter of fact, that word witchcraft 
comes from the word pharmakia, which we get our word pharmacy from. And if you'll think about drugs and different things that can control a person's mind, but classical witchcraft in God's word is defined as sorcery. It's defined as as uh, the the use of drugs or even the use of spells being used to control or manipulate. It can be used. Witchcraft is is often described in God's word as the use of evil uh, occult powers, evil dark demonic powers, the powers of demons and evil spirits. And how many of you know that is very much real around the world today, the classical witchcraft that the Bible talks about. That's why we don't allow our children to read Harry Potter and watch Twilight and all these things because the Bible warns against those things. Now, you can, again, I said some of you are going to get upset and get angry with me, but why would I want to bring into my home the very things that God's Word says over and over again are an abomination in the sight of the Lord. Not going to do it. But that's not what I'm preaching about today. I'm preaching this morning on charismatic witchcraft. Now, I'm using the term this morning, charismatic witchcraft, to describe, follow along, take notes if you're a note taker, to describe any misuse of spiritual or soulish power in order to manipulate and control others. I'm going to say that again so that you get it here this morning. I'm using the term charismatic witchcraft to describe any misuse of spiritual power, any misuse of soulish power in order to manipulate or control another person. Charismatic witchcraft is what works in the church when an individual or a group of people try to use their influence or use their control or use their leadership role or use their power in order to manipulate and control other groups of people, especially the leadership of the church. But I'm going to tell you, it can go both ways because I've seen charismatic witchcraft at work when a minister uses charismatic witchcraft, when a minister controls his congregation with fear and intimidation, that's an example of charismatic witchcraft. When a board member controls the rest of the board and even the church by his ungodly influence or intimidation or his harmful opinions, this is an example of charismatic witchcraft. When an influential person in the church tries to use his or her influence to control or manipulate other people's opinions and actions, that's charismatic witchcraft. I'll never forget a professor at CBC telling me, when you go into a church as a new pastor, you need to find four or five of the most influential people in the church and make them your best friends. Take them out to dinner. Really spend time with them because if you can get their vote, if you can get their allegiance, then you'll get the entire churches. I thought, what a misuse of spiritual power for me to come in and find the who's who's of the church, get buddy-buddy with them so that we can together control the entire church. How many of you have seen that in operation before? That's not the model Jesus gave. Jesus rebuked the who's 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 and the influential and he went to the who's nots glory to God he went to the people who needed a savior praise God hallelujah anyone who tries to use the power of God and the word of God to influence or control other people in order to have his or her own selfish way is operating in what we're going to call today charismatic witchcraft now write this down Charismatic witchcraft uses the works of the flesh and a false spirituality to gain influence and power over others. Let me say it again so you can catch it today. Charismatic witchcraft uses the work of the flesh and a false spirituality to gain influence and power over others. I want to read again this week from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse number 19, the Word of God says, it says, You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you and pushes himself forward or slaps you in the face. 
to my shame I admit that we were too weak for that, God's Word says. Paul was saying, you foolish Corinthians, you, you foolish Corinthians who you're allowing carnal, you're allowing worldly men to enslave you and bring you into bondage unto themselves. Now, that word here in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, bondage, comes from the Greek word katadulu, which means to enslave or bring the mind under another person's control. This is the bondage that the Apostle Paul's talking about. He says you're foolish because you've allowed someone else, you've allowed another person operating in witchcraft possibly, but you've allowed a false teacher, you've allowed another person's influence to bring your mind under their control. And it's enslaved you. It's brought you into the word he uses here. It's brought you into bondage. And then he said you'll be devoured. And that word devour comes from the Greek word katistio, which means to eat away at one's property and consume or destroy a person. So the bondage that you're in is going to devour you. It's going to eat away at you ultimately with the purpose of destroying you. Now, how many of you in this place this morning have ever noticed how cult leaders, cult, leaders of, of different cults, how cult leaders uh, are able to uh, influence their followers in such a way that their followers will sell all their possessions, leave their lands, leave their homes, and, and give them their money, give them, uh, give them their, their inheritance, if you will. The, 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 these, these, these cult leaders influence people in such a way that people will literally give them their retirement and follow them. Now, this is the kind of rebuke that we see Paul rebuking the people for. Paul was rebuking the Corinthians for allowing false apostles and leaders to control and to manipulate them. Now, I, I used to wonder how cult leaders could absolutely control and devour their followers. Most of you probably remember the story of Jim Jones and, and remember the tragedy uh, that, that happened as a result of the witchcraft that was in operation. Jim Jones, who was Pentecostal in some ways, he, he, he somehow or another caused his Christian followers to drink the, the poisonous and deadly Kool-Aid and history tells us that 914 people died because of that man's control and manipulation. You all remember a few years back David Koresh in Texas who believed he was the Messiah and, and, and part of his false teaching was that he was the husband to all, to all these women and he was even married to underage women and, uh, and, to, and to young girls and, and he caused his followers to be burned alive in the name of Jesus Christ including 20 children who were burned alive on that horrible day in Texas. And then, of course, a few years ago, the, the Heaven's Gate uh, uh, saga, if you will, the two leaders of that cult called Heaven Gates, they were convinced that they were the two witnesses of the book of Revelation and caused many to follow, follow them. And on the dreadful day at the very end, they caused 39 of their followers to, uh, to drink the deadly uh, cyanide mixed with pineapple juice and vodka vodka and they were all dressed in black with with similar uh, similar uh, 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 tennis shoes on and armband patches that said heaven's gates away team and they all laid there dead you see what I'm talking about this morning is very real cult leaders operate in the force of witchcraft to manipulate and to control their followers. You say, what does this have to do with me? I'm not, I'm not following a, a cult leader. I'm not part of a cult. What, what does this have to do with my life today? Well, it's important that we get a good grasp of what witchcraft means and how it operates. Another definition besides control and manipulation is an irresistible influence. It's one person or a few people influencing the rest for their own selfish purposes. Listen to me, moms. 
mothers can be used in this work of the flesh called witchcraft when you're trying to control your own grown children. That's the flesh of witchcraft operating in a very negative way. I've seen employees use witchcraft against their against their bosses they use a negative spirit over their bosses to get their own way to to do what they want they they rebel uh, or, or whatever the case may be operating in a spirit of witchcraft but how does it work in the church I'm gonna give you some examples of how charismatic witchcraft works in the church and if we're not careful it will work right here and can work right through your life matter of fact I have never seen the 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 the, the misuse of spiritual power I've never seen charismatic witchcraft work in 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 anybody except for people who were uh, and I'm going to do quote unquote spiritual people. It, it seems to it seems to uh, the the people that really are are spiritual and and being used in the gifts. They seem to almost be a magnet if they're not careful for this charismatic witchcraft to work in their life. So I don't care how spiritual you may feel you are today. Listen to some examples and be careful that it doesn't work in your life to seduce you. This morning, the first way that it works that I'm going to expose today from the pulpit is it can operate and work through the Jezebel spirit. Everybody say the Jezebel spirit. Don't turn to your neighbor and look at him when you say that. Look up here at me. Stay out of trouble this morning. Amen. The Jezebel spirit. Let me talk quickly about the Jezebel spirit. The Jezebel spirit, which I've encountered every church I've pastored, I've encountered it all of my ministry. There's nowhere you're going to go that the Jezebel spirit is not working. And men, please don't put your fingers in your ear. The Jezebel spirit can operate through you just as it can through women. Because the Jezebel spirit is more than just a woman controlling a man. It's a spirit. It is somebody controlling somebody that God's not given them authority and leadership to control or to be above. Now hear me today, the Jezebel spirit is a religious spirit. It's a religious spirit of witchcraft that sits in our churches everywhere, manipulating, intimidating, uh, domineering, undermining the man or the leadership in the pulpit. The Jezebel spirit, I'm going to say it again, is a spirit that works in our churches every day, everywhere. I promise you, because there's so many of us here this morning, the Jezebel spirit will be at operation at lunchtime at some restaurant in this city today. There'll be some people at some church somewhere, hopefully not here, but yes, quite possible, that will sit around and order their fried chicken and they'll begin to plot a plan how to be able to how to be able to uh, 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 to, uh, to to remove the pastor, or how to be able to to uh, to control the pastor to get what they want. I'm going to tell you today, it's a spirit that will operate to be able to to come in and bring division and intimidation and to domineer and control. Now, hear me this morning. A Jezebel has absolutely no regard for the authority that God's put in place and it operates in opposition to the will of God with the intent of stopping his plans. That's so important you get this because I don't know about you, but I believe God wants to send a mighty revival to the city of Little Rock and I believe God wants to blow right through this place and do great and mighty things that we've never seen or heard about. I believe God wants to send a river through this place that's going to be absolutely life-changing to our church and to our city. And I'm going to tell you today, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. I'm not in the ministry for a career I'm not in the minute if I if I wanted a career I would go find one that paid more money than the ministry pays hello and doesn't have as many problems as the ministry has at times I believe God wants to do great and mighty things I'm convinced of it with all of my heart and I'm gonna tell you as God starts to move into this place there will be some people that will have the opportunity to operate in the Jezebel spirit to stop the move of God some of you won't be happy with it and you'll fight against it. Some of you won't want it and you'll fight against it. 
Some of you thought you wanted a change, but you didn't want the change God had in mind. You want what you have in mind, but not what God has in mind. That's how the Jezebel spirit operates. It operates with the intent of stopping the plans of God. you got to be careful. Revival church, it will happen every time when revival comes. We've got to be careful and not allow this work of the flesh to come in and use us to be a hindering force to the will and to the move of God. The Jezebel spirit seeks to destroy anyone in authority, whether that be the pastor, the elder, the prophet of God, the worship leader, the prayer leader, and will take that authority any way she or he can get it. The Jezebel spirit is when a woman, or I said earlier, or a man, asserts authority over another man or men and tries to control them. That's witchcraft. In the Old Testament, King Ahab lost his kingdom because of his overwhelming and overpowerful wife, Jezebel. That's where we get this name, Jezebel. King Ahab's wife in the Old Testament. Instead of righteously leading the kingdom that God had given him, instead of righteously leading this kingdom, he allowed his heathen wife, Jezebel, to reign over the land. And if you know the story, you know everything that happened because of that. She brought all kinds of abominations into, into the nation, including the worship of Baal. The Jezebel spirit inside of her brought these kind of abominations. The Bible says in 1 Kings 21, verse 25, that there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Now listen to that. There was none like Ahab who did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord all because of what his wife Jezebel stirred up. That's how this, this witchcraft, the spirit of Jezebel works. It tries to stir things up. It's, it's a spirit that tries to stir up people against leadership or stir up people against the move of God or, or stir, stir people up against what God is saying and against what God is doing. His spirit, her spirit stirred up. That means encourage. It means in the strongs persuaded or manipulated. That same Jezebel spirit of witchcraft still tries to stir up, still tries to manipulate, still tries to influence and control today. When a person of lower authority tries to manipulate a person of higher authority, that is the Jezebel spirit in operation. Ahab was a weak leader. He didn't have a backbone. And that's why he allowed it to happen. You will not find the Jezebel spirit out of control in churches where the pastor in the pulpit isn't a weak leader. I'm going to tell you what the churches in America today need. They need some preachers and pastors and shepherds and leaders who will get a backbone and who will, and who will, who will be strong in his, in, in his or her beliefs. That we, we need some people in the pulpit today who aren't going to back down to every Jezebel spirit and who aren't going to cower down in a corner to every person in their church operating in witchcraft. <clears throat> because of its need to control it can only operate effectively when Ahab's weak leaders are present listen to me today please listen to me some people's commitment to the church some people's commitment to their leadership role or whatever it may be is only as strong as their ability to be able to influence and be able to rub shoulders with leaders or their ability to control what happens at that church but thank God God restored her set her free and 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 used her in that ministry because she was very good at it but some people you begin to take their control away and they give you bye-bye and you've all seen it if you've been in church at all you've seen it you've seen it you take that away you stop them and they leave the Jezebel spirit Whew. man this is fun this morning isn't it I like soul ties last week I told you this is a tough series it's a tough one 
And the enemy, it was pretty evident, he didn't want us to talk about this one today. But you know, this charismatic witchcraft, kind of with the Jezebel spirit, but even from a different angle, another way it operates in the church is through the rebellious spirit. Spirit of rebellion. The rebellious spirit. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15 that rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. For rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. Rebellion is the same as what we've been talking about. Controlling, trying to manipulate. I'll rebel against that. I'm going my own way. I'm rebelling against leadership. I'm rebelling against the Holy Spirit. And we see here that Saul, Saul became both rebellious and arrogant. He became rebellious and arrogant, and God, leave, God finally rejected him and took away his kingdom. How many of you see what this happens when the witchcraft spirit's operating? Kingdoms get lost. Churches die. Ministries die when these spirits aren't dealt with. That's why we're dealing with them from the pulpit today. Saul was not obedient to God. And disobedience to God is acting in rebellion against God. Let me say that again. Disobedience to God is acting in rebellion. If I tell Haven, go upstairs, clean your room, don't come back downstairs till it's clean. And five minutes later, she's back down there eating herself a Pop-Tart. And I say, is your room clean? She says, no, I don't really want to do it. It's like she asked me, she asked me not before last, she said, Dad, what do you want for Christmas? I'm getting y'all's Christmas presents ready. Macy snuck in and already opened hers. There was a quarter bottle of perfume, a half a bottle of lotion. Haven's going around her room just taking stuff, wrapping it, like all kids do at that age. But she said, Dad, what do you want? I said, I don't want anything. Got everything I want. I just want you, baby. She said, how about cleaning coupons? I'll make little coupons and then uh, it'll be your present. And when you want me to clean something, I'll give it to you. you or you can give it to me. You want me I'll do one for doing dishes. And you, I said, no. I said, I'm your dad. I don't need coupons. I t whatever I tell you to do, you can do. I don't need a coupon to get you to work, girl. The only reason you don't do much now is because you're only nine. But when you get in them double digits of ten, man, it's, it's, we're going hardcore with it. She said, how about, my, how about back rub coupons? I said, no, same thing. If I want you to rub my back, I'll tell you to rub my back. Save yourself the time and effort. Crystal told me, she said, do you know what she wrapped, made for you? I said, what? She said she made massage coupons for you. And they're all six hours a piece. And she told Crystal yesterday, they were out shopping, she told Crystal, she said, Crystal, or she said, Mom, <laughs> She said, she said, Mom, I've never rubbed Dad more than a minute. I don't know if I can make six hours. <laughs> Crystal said, Honey, I'll give you some money and we'll get your dad a present. But she comes downstairs and says, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to. She's operating in rebellion. That's a rebellious spirit. She's choosing to do what she wants to do rather than what leadership or her authority, her father has told her to do. Now when you hear the word rebellion, I'm sure there's many things that, that come to mind. Images of revolt, maybe chaos, people acting in a dis, disorderly manner. Rebellion comes in many forms, but listen to me today. There's a common form that runs through all forms of rebellion. And it is the resistance to instructions. Resistance to instructions. When people, when people choose <clears throat> to rebel against leadership and established ground rules for conduct, this is, this is the rules of my house. This is how we operate. This is, this is what's going to happen here. When people choose to, uh, to rebel against those things, they set themselves up for failure. Did you hear me? It's the same thing in the church house. There's going to be rules in this church house. There's going to be things that, 
you will not be permitted to do. And when you choose not to do those things or when you choose to rebel against leadership, you're going to fail every time. And unfortunately, your failure may be destructive. Your failure may hurt. <laughs> Hello now. Your failure could cost you your life. Have you read the Bible? <laughs> Have you read the Old Testament about how many died because of rebellion? It's destructive. God honors those who honors His rules. Have you ever met anyone in the church with a rebellious spirit? Church is headed for revival. One person doesn't want it. I always found it interesting. It's time to build a new building. We vote. One person will be against it. 99% for it. 1% against it. I always wonder who this one person is. How, are the, how is 99 out of 100 of us in agreement? And there's one person... Now, I've met that one person before. Here's what they've told me. Well, Pastor, I just feel like there needs to be at least one no. What spirit are you operating in? I mean, wouldn't it be embarrassing to be that one person? <laughs> that one person who goes the opposite way every time? Every time. Psalm 68 verse 6 describes the con consequences of being rebellious. It says, God sets the lonely in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. To dwell in a dry land is to live a life that is marked with spiritual and natural drought. From a spiritual perspective, this means the blessing, the wisdom, the supernatural power of God is, is disrupted in your life because of rebellion. In addition, rebellion opens that door for physical destruction. And I wish I could tell another story here, but it's, it, it's almost, some of you go, oh. But I've seen it. I've seen people with sickness not able to be healed because of rebellion. Last but not least this morning, how witchcraft works in the church. Through the spirit of Jezebel, through the rebellious spirit. And I hope you're checking yourself today. But last, number three, is through abused and misused gifts. Abused and misused gifts. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, hear this, says the gifts of God or the callings of God are uh, uh, irrevocable. The gifts of God, the callings of God are irrevocable. God doesn't take them back. If God anoints you to preach, you will, you will be able to preach all your life. Even if you fall into deep sin, you can preach. He doesn't take them back. I've had people say to me when, when, they've seen, when they've seen someone fall, and, you know, we used to gasp when a preacher fell, a famous preacher. Now it happens every day. Not much talk about it. But I've heard people even, even back to Swaggart, and, and I'm not talking down of Swaggart at all. I believe he had the ability to be restored just as any one of us who have sinned. But I, I, I remember people would say, he was living in that, he, he was doing that stuff and, and still up there able to preach like that and healing the sick? How? I don't understand that. Talking about it this morning. Misuse of spiritual gifts. Using those gifts to keep his kingdom. Using those spiritual gifts to keep the kingdom from falling using the gifts of the spirit and the call of God even in sin so you got to be careful because even Christians who fall back into the sins of the flesh can still be operating 
in spiritual gifts. That's something. They can still be demonstrating spiritual gifts. And sadly, some Christians will use, hear this, this is where we've got to expose this seduction. Some Christians fall into using their gifts for their own benefit or their own financial gain or self-glory. Healing evangelists will persuade people to send them money so they can receive a healing. Now, I know we've got fans of Christian television, but I'm going to tell you, you'll never hear from this pulpit me saying to you, if you will sow a seed of $1,000 today, you'll get your healing. And anybody that you're listening to on TV that's trying to get you to send money so you can get your blessing, you need to go back to that 2 Corinthians 11. Realize you're being devoured. They're taking advantage of you for their own glory. They're asking for your money and you ought to see what kind of house they're living in. They're not all bad. But there's a bunch of them out there. they wolves in sheep clothing. You don't have to buy your miracle. It's already been paid for. Nothing wrong with sowing seed and blessing the ministry so it can go forth and preach the gospel, but you're not buying anything. I had an evangelist from South Africa. Before, before the first service, we started that Sunday night. Before it started, we were in my office, and I said, let's pray and pray for the service tonight. We were praying for the service, and I said, uh, I said got you your microphone. He wanted a certain kind of microphone. Got you your bottle of water. Anything else you need for the service? Just trying to be kind as the pastor. And he said, well, one other thing. He said, how I'm kind of going to do my service tonight is I'm going to come up and I'm going to pray for the sick and we're going to see healings and miracles and then I'll preach. He said, if you would, if you will allow me to receive my offering after I pray for the sick. And he said, and he kind of whispered it like this. He said, because they'll give more after they see miracles. He wanted me, the pastor, to allow him to take up his own offering after he gets out and performs some miracles so the people will give him more money. He didn't stay in town long, did he? That revival lasted Sunday night. I let him go ahead and preach that night. Abuse of gifts. Man, we're about done, church. Be careful. Now, it's easy for us to sit here and amen when we talk about them healing evangelists and TV preachers. Y'all like, yes, amen. Y'all like, hallelujah. He's dealing with TV preachers. And I watch a lot of TV church. There's a few I like and enjoy. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But let's bring it to home. Because we can sit and clap and amen about these TV preachers and these healing evangelists all day long. But what about the roles right here in the church? What about the role of deacon? I think I just heard a pin drop on the back row. Deacons are chosen to serve. Do you know the word deacon means servant? They are chosen to help visit the sick, care for the widows, and so on. Not control the pastor. Well, I can't wait till the next election because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rally votes to get on that deacon board because if I can get on that deacon board, I can put a stop to all this. And listen, if you're newer to the church, I'm not preaching this stuff because we've got issues here with our current deacons and leadership role. What I'm preaching is to help us keep from ever allowing that to happen. Hello. We've got to be careful. Misuse. The misuse of prophecy and prophets. 
if I hear another prophetic word over my life that God's going to give me a big ministry, I think I'm going to vomit. It's, it's all I've ever heard. Pastor, do you have a minute? I have a word for you. The Lord wants to say He's going to give you a big ministry. And they start puffing me up for the next five minutes of prophesying. Did you know the Word of God says that all prophecy should bring glory and honor to Jesus? Not to me, not to you. Be careful how prophecies operate. Don't prophesy vain prophecies and start operating in this charismatic witchcraft. Be careful what you prophesy. It better be from the Lord. You know what? How about this one? Candace, I have a word from the Lord for you. God has an awesome ministry plan for you. But your husband is standing in the way. He is a thorn in your flesh. He is a distraction to what God has for you. So the Spirit of God says, Thus saith the Lord, you have my blessing to divorce your husband and be married unto the Lord and go forth and do great and mighty works, thus saith the Lord. You all know that happens in charismatic circles every day. What's wrong with that? It contradicts the Word of God. Oh, y'all wait now. Just take that dial on that clock and start it back over to 10, 10 a.m. because they all woke up right there. Everybody like woke up. They got out of bed. Woo, warm come over them. They're like, hallelujah. Pull the blanket off. I'm here. Glory to God. Or no, maybe y'all sitting there thinking, maybe if we talk and laugh a little bit, he really will let us go. Amen. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you today charismatic witchcraft.